I've always been fascinated by entrepreneurship. Uh, my dad was an entrepreneur, and as you may gather, I grew up in Ireland. So from the time I was about this high, I worked in you know, his cake shop, the bakery, the delicatessen. And my dad was an incredible person. But unfortunately, we were bankrupt twice. And in Ireland in the 1970s, that was not fun. And I swore that I was never going to have anything to do with it. Uh, my siblings, a couple of engineers, doctor, banker. Now, but the interesting thing is, you know, what I wanted to do was go get myself a job that was dependable. I became an engineer, joined the big American firm, and that's where I thought that entrepreneurship was way too risky for me. But it was wrong. And there's a couple of things I've learned. So now, having worked at a high-tech startup, and also now that I run an early-stage technology investment fund, what I've really come to learn, and one of the things I want to share with you today is Maybe there's some things along the way that I could have told my dad that may have made things different. Now, when I tell people that what I do is that I teach entrepreneurship, they look at me like I'm nuts. Like, how on earth do you teach that stuff? Well, you know, if you want to run and you've got two legs and you come to me as a runner, I can teach you how to run. Perhaps I can even get you to do a marathon. You know, and that puts you in the point one percenters of all Americans, by the way. Um, but the other thing is, especially in this country, we have this huge emphasis for our kids, especially at this school, on scientific thinking. But you know, we never think for a second that we can't teach people to think scientifically. So from the time my kids have been in elementary school, they've been taught that they can form a hypothesis, they can test it, and then off they go. They're popping Mentos into Coke bottles, they're blowing up volcanoes, they're having a blast, and as they grow up, they realize that scientific thinking is really just a way of looking at and thinking about problems. So entrepreneurial thinking is very much just a way of looking at and thinking about, but very, very much about doing something about problems. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is what are those five skills that we can really learn from the entrepreneurs who build great, enduring companies in this country that I can teach and teach every day at the University of Washington. But before I start, there's sort of this myth about the entrepreneur that gets in our way. So Scott showed you the picture of Bill Gates. When I mention the word uh, entrepreneur, who pops into your brain? It's Gates, or Bezos, or Richard Branson. But there is no one type of person that's an entrepreneur. And everybody isn't born to be one. You do not have to be born to be an entrepreneur. So there's all sorts of characters. I mean, if I start to think about the characteristics of entrepreneurs. So they can be incredibly gregarious. They can be really shy. They can be these you know, big, big, big picture thinkers, or they can be these obsessive control freaks. So you know, for instance, if you're a loudmouth, like Ted Turner, it's natural. You'll start CNN. If you're a geek and you're afraid to approach girls directly, what are you going to do? Start Facebook. <laughs> if, if if the only way to become, I had to put today's one in. If, if today, you know, if the only way to be an entrepreneur was to be born to be one, Colonel Saunders would never have started Kentucky Fried Chicken when he was in his 60s and on Social Security. But the myth, the myth, right? The myth starts something like this. So Shannon is an entrepreneur. Shannon wakes up in the middle of the night, brilliant idea, the light bulb goes off. You've seen the cartoons. Next morning, what Shannon does, she gets up, she writes down everything she knew. She contacts a patent attorney, hires this ace team. They write this amazing kick-ass business plan. They get the tier one venture capitalists from Silicon Valley, Sequoia, somebody like that on board, and they're off. They write this amazing business plan. They've got their goals set in mind. Next time we see Shannon, she's sitting on the couch. She's fiddling with her Rolex watch, thinking about buying a share in NetJets. Now, Maybe, maybe that's the reality for the 0.001% of entrepreneurs out there. What I really want to talk about is how we educate the other 99.9%. .9%. So and in that way, the story goes something like this. Again, we have Shannon. Shannon's an entrepreneur. Shannon loves food. She's always wanted to open a restaurant. But like two thirds of the entrepreneurs out there who create great companies, Shannon's broke because she's either been fired or she was let go from her previous company. 
But unfortunately, the bills are still coming in the door, so Shannon has to do something. So what does she do? Looks at the local office building. What Shannon's going to do is she's going to start catering lunch. So she starts bringing in the sandwiches. Oh my God, they love Shannon. They just can't get enough of her. It's the cute Irish accent. She starts bringing in little pieces of brown bread. All of a sudden, they're asking her stories about Ireland. So she starts arranging travel for them to get them to go to Ireland. Soon, what Shannon has is you know, the classic Irish cooking schools of Ireland. And then she starts arranging trekking trips. She branches into golfing. And then it's Scotland and Wales. So where Shannon started was wanting to start a restaurant. Where Shannon ended up was being an international travel mogul. Now, these two different approaches are what we call the strategic approach versus the entrepreneurial or effectual approach. An effectual thinker is somebody who believes they can shape their own world. But to really get you to understand this, it's probably best to have an example. So let's talk about a dinner party. So the managerial approach to the dinner party is, I send out an invitation to eight people, maybe two weeks in advance, pull down my recipe books, go through the list, go to the shop, buy everything, make a nice dinner. And on the appointed hour, my eight friends show up. We have a great dinner. It's perfect. Now, the entrepreneur, on the other hand, is somebody who's totally comfortable with the idea of charging into somebody else's kitchen an hour before eight people are going to show up, and they start opening cupboards. Now, they're still going to get dinner on the table, and they believe they'll have dinner on the table, and it'll be just fine, and everybody's going to have a great time. So it's that kind of effectual thinking that what do I do with the resources I have at hand? Not what is my end goal and how do I get there? That's one of the things that we teach every single day. And it's a skill now you can absolutely learn. Now, you might think that the strategically managed approach, the ordered approach, is far more successful. Absolutely not. So one of the classic studies that was done on the entrepreneurs who built the greatest enduring companies, 18 of them in this country, in Built to Last, what they looked at was only three of those 18 were started with a business plan and the goal in mind. The other 15 were the uh, let's try lots of things approach that, that really is that effectual thinking that we teach. So case in point, Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard was started late in the 1930s when Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard get together. All they had was $538 and just the knowledge that they wanted to start a company together, but they didn't know what it was going to be. First product, they did a line fault detector for bowling. Uh, probably never heard of it, right? The next thing they did was they came up with a sort of clock mechanisms for telescopes, and they were right on the way into their next hot idea, which was an automatic flusher for urinals, when, as serendipity would have it, have it another young entrepreneur, Walt Disney, was around. And what Walt Disney at the time was doing was he was creating this amazingly musical cartoon called Fantasia. And the thing that Walt Disney needed was some sound equipment to test the sound quality in the studios and in the 12 cinemas where he was going to screen it. So nevertheless, they stopped working on their automatic flushing urinal, and they created the first 12 audio oscillators that they sold to Walt Disney. Absolutely seizing on the sense of the surprise, one of the other things we sell to students. Yesterday, or yesterday, last year, 2011, Hewlett Packard was $125 billion in revenue. So what I want to talk about is, who are these entrepreneurs, and how do we teach them, and how do they build these great, enduring companies? So being in a business school, of course, I happen to have a nifty slide and graph to explain this. Three-dimensional, no less. So what you'll see is on the x-axis here, we have the amount of investment. This is the amount of money it takes to launch these companies. And on the y-axis, we have what will be their most likely profit. And on the z-axis is the really, really interesting one. So this is a measure of the level of uncertainty in the market. So to put this in context for you, in the United States business census, the last one that was done, there are about 30 million companies in the United States. Of those, fewer than 5% ever make more than $1 million a year. So those are the companies that are what we call in the bottom corner here. Those are the low risk kind of companies, those sole entrepreneurship type companies. These are the lawnmower businesses, the hair businesses. So because they're really, really low risk, consequently, they've sort of a very, very low profit potential. They're not the ones we're interested in. 
What we're really interested in are who are the entrepreneurs that are going to create the companies that are going to become the corporations like Hewlett Packard, like Boeing, um, and Disney, all the companies that were in the study. So the entrepreneur in this case is not a person who's starting a lawnmower or real estate business. They start off in this back left hand corner here, which I call the uh, heads I win, tails I don't lose too much. Now remember, these entrepreneurs are incredibly successful though. The case study for these was the Inc. 500 list. Now what the Inc. 500 list is, it's the 500 fastest growing private companies in the United States. And these are not small companies. They only have four, four years of track record in general, but their average revenues are between 15 and 20 million. Their growth rates, even at that revenue run rate, are about 1,000% a, a year. So these are incredibly successful companies, all started by entrepreneurs. The vast majority of them start, as I said, in this back left-hand corner. Like Shannon, they've either been fired or they've lost their previous job. So two-thirds of these people are fired. They have to get out there and just do something. Um, anything to get things going. And because they don't have a great idea, nobody's prepared to put any money in them. This is not Shannon and her crack team with the great, brilliant idea. 70% um, of them just replicated something they saw at their previous employer. And 40% of them never wrote a business plan. The next 20% said they had something on the back of a napkin. So the second thing they have to do, the first thing they have to do is do something. The second thing they do, because they have no money, is they've got to beg, borrow, steal, con people into giving them resources. Fantastic example here, this great entrepreneur I worked with called Christy Marshbanks had a company here in Seattle called CTAB Software. And what they did was they created inventory analysis software. Uh, no money, no budget, couldn't afford to travel, looked out the window and they saw Bartels and went, aha, walked into Bartels and said, just please give us one company's worth of inventory information for the weekend and we'll come back and we'll show you what we can do. Monday morning comes around in the March, talk to Bartels, Bartels are wowed. They really are. And they said, okay, take all 50 of our stores and show us what you can do. At which point Christy says, well, not so fast. Uh, we don't have any machines and we don't have a data center. So of course a beautiful relationship is born because Bartels immediately says, okay, well what we'll do is we'll fund the data systems if you can do this level of analysis for us. Now two things happen here, and this is very important. The first thing that happens is, you know, Christy has brought these resources on board for nothing, but the second thing that happens is she has now started transitioning all this way down to being a real corporation. She's no longer in this heads I win, tails I don't lose too much quadrant of our graph, not at all. She's got a marquee customer on board. She's got a lot to lose now, and the stakes only get higher as you transverse, you know, you wake down here. So by the time you're a corporation, you've got to be incredibly careful. And so what you do is you spend lots and lots of money to buy down that uncertainty. But of course then, you've got to have a much higher potential profit to make that worthwhile. So when you're Fred Storm Door and Motor Car Company back here and you launch the Edsel, well, it's not actually this great big deal. On the other hand, if you're Ford Motor Corporation, what happens is you've got two and a half thousand people who are driving those cars who could be killed. So that's what, now, in business education, the piece we excel at is down here. We got this piece nailed, all right? We can teach people to be managerial thinkers. We teach them how to analyze a market, how to create an environment that they can take care of that uncertainty, how to create an oper operations plan, how to write a budget. But the piece in entrepreneurship education that we want to excel at is how do we create these amazing entrepreneurs that are going to create these enduring companies that are the true, true job engines, the gazelles of the economy in this country. So the five things that we teach students that are critically important is the first one, as I've talked about, get out there and just do something. So what we do is we put students in a class where in the course of 10 weeks, they don't have to just come up with a business plan. They actually have to launch a company, borrow some money from us and get real revenue producing customers. We get them out there. The second thing that they have to do is figure out how to get those resources on board because we only give them a couple of hundred dollars and what they have to do, and soon what you see is they've press ganged their fraternity brothers, their sorority sisters, they've got their parents packing boxes for them, they've, they've nailed everybody on the entrepreneurship advisory board uh, to work and help them and, and that's pretty amazing. So they really learn how to get those resources on board. 
Now, the third thing they have to do is, remember, they have to learn how to embrace surprise. You know, if it's a freezing cold day and they started out selling lemonade, they need to go home and get a thermos and start doing hot chocolate instead. And the fourth thing, and this is one of the things, as I said at the very beginning, I thought it was all about risk. Great entrepreneurs do not take huge risks. Remember, the vast majority of them start back out here. They've got nothing to lose. Great entrepreneurs do not take great risks. What great entrepreneurs do is they minimize the downside of any of that risk. So when Richard Branson, already an incredibly successful entrepreneur, was going to launch Virgin Airlines, he had it written into the contract with Boeing that at the end of the first year, if it didn't work out, they were going to take that airplane back. So one of the things we teach students to do is they don't, it's not about, min, it's about minimizing your downside. And that's very important. But the final thing we teach students to do, and this is key, is we teach them to be those effectual thinkers. We teach them to believe that by running this company and giving them the money, two things happen every single year. The first thing is that the fund that we use to, it's only five, it only started as a $5,000 fund. This fund that we give them money from makes money every single year, so they pay us back. But the second thing that happens is they're bitten by the bug. They absolutely learn how to see themselves as people who are the pilot in command. They are running their own business. Now that does not mean they're incredibly successful. They can fail miserably, but we've, we've minimized the risk. It's, it's not a big failure. And they totally see themselves as people who at some stage can go ahead and go do something. And that's entrepreneurship education. So when we think about it, the thing that we do in managerial education, as I said, is what we really teach people is how to get, with a goal in mind, the managerial approach. We teach them that with the goal in mind, this is the classic managerial education we see. There you are, goal driven, have at, go for it. But in entrepreneurship education, what we really teach students is to prepare for a world like this. So if you think about it, that great business philosopher Confucius said uh, 2,000 years ago, what I hear, I forget. And what I see, I remember. But what I do, I learn. And that's what entrepreneurship education is all about. Thank you.